It's early evening on September 27, 1946, at the de Havilland Aircraft Company in Hatfield, England, just outside London. On the company's small airfield, 36-year-old test pilot Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. puts on his leather gloves and folds his tall frame into the tiny cockpit of a plane called the de Havilland 108 Swallow. It's the latest experimental jet plane from his father's company, and he's about to put it to the ultimate test. The Swallow is a strange-looking aircraft. It's small and sleek, a bullet with massive wings that sweep back towards its stump of a tail. The de Havilands hope that with these unique design features, the Swallow will go faster than any plane has gone before. The Havilands' ground crew pushes the plane into position. He waves to a small crowd of onlookers, then takes off. The setting sun stretches the shadows of the trees and the people watching him. Everything on the ground gets smaller as de Havilland ascends, pointing his plane towards the tidal flats of the Thames River estuary. That's where, in a dive starting at 10,000 feet, he'll attempt to break the speed record. He reads the altimeter on his dashboard and radios to his flight crew on the ground. 5,000 feet. A few years earlier, his younger brother died while testing their father's other airplane, the de Havilland Mosquito. De Havilland Jr. knows what he is about to do is dangerous. That's why he's attempting it over the estuary, away from populated areas. 8,000 feet. Today, he's going to see what this sleekly designed plane can do at full power. His goal is to take the Swallow up to Mach 1, about 760 miles per hour. In other words, you'll be the first person to fly at the speed of sound. Others have tried before him and failed. Some say it can't be done. The Havilland just thinks it hasn't been tried with the right plane. 10,000 feet, Godspeed. Good luck, Jeffrey. De Havilland tilts the plane and goes into a dive. His plane gathers speed. Everything trembles against the pressure of the atmosphere. He accelerates past 650 miles per hour. Then, something terrible happens. Oh. Oh. On the ground, through their binoculars, onlookers on the banks of the estuary see his plane light up and streak across the dusk like a match struck against the sky. At somewhere just over 0.9 Mach, the swallow disintegrates in mid-air, as if crushed into tiny pieces by some invisible force. People watch in horror as the debris rains down onto the mudflats below. Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. has just become the latest pilot to die while attempting to cross what aviators called the sound barrier. This invisible barrier baffled engineers and terrified pilots. Nobody could understand why the normal laws of physics seemed to be suspended as planes approached the speed of sound. But with jet technology becoming more sophisticated and militaries around the world jockeying for control of the skies, more and more people were willing to risk their lives to find out. From Wondery, I'm Stephen Johnson, and this is American Innovations. During World War II, Germany showed the world the importance of speed in military aviation when it introduced the Messerschmitt, the first jet-powered aircraft. Fighter planes that used jets instead of propellers could fly higher and faster, evading less sophisticated enemy aircraft and ground weapons. The race to control the skies was on, a race that would continue after the war ended. With the Soviet Union gaining power and communism beginning to spread across the globe, the U.S. and its allies hoped that ever faster planes would give them an edge in any future war. Starting in the 1940s, airplane speed records were continually being set and broken. But once pilots began to hit high enough speeds, they felt like they were hitting a wall, literally. The faster any object travels, the more it compresses the air in front of it. 
At very high speeds, the effects of compressibility are so great that traveling through air can start to feel almost like traveling through liquid. And when a plane approaches the speed of sound, something else happens too. The sound of the plane's engine begins adding to the turbulence. Sound waves, just like air, compress around an object traveling at high speed. At transonic speeds, 0.8 Mach and higher, flying a plane begins to feel like sailing a ship through choppy seas. As the plane approaches the speed of sound, Mach 1, that turbulence can become shock waves that strike the plane from all sides, like waves crashing into a ship. Early high-speed pilots described the sensation of those shock waves as like trying to, quote, fly a straw in a hurricane. Sure, there were bullets and rockets, objects that went faster than the speed of sound. Those objects were capable of making it through the mythical sound barrier. But could a plane do this too? To keep up with the speed race, aviation engineers developed stronger engines and experimented with aerodynamic bodies. The planes got faster and faster. But hanging over this whole enterprise was the question, was there a limit to how fast these planes could go? And was testing that limit a death sentence for pilots? This is episode one of our two-part series on breaking the sound barrier, a bullet with wings. It's March 5th, 1944, two years before the de Havilland crash. On the ground and in the air, World War II rages across Europe, including here in the skies over the south of France, where 21-year-old American fighter pilot Chuck Yeager is falling out of the sky. He's at 15,000 feet, and his hand is clutching the ring to his parachute. But he doesn't pull it. Not yet. If he pulls too early, the Germans who just shot down his plane will see him. This is Jaeger's eighth mission, and the first time he's had to bail out. But he doesn't panic. His training kicks in. And something deeper. Where most people would feel terror, Jaeger feels thrilled. He's an adrenaline junkie. And right now, the adrenaline is pumping through him like rocket fuel. The clouds part under him, and he sees the forest and field below. He can smell them, even. The ground is getting closer and closer. He waits until the last possible minute, and then he pulls the ripcord ring. The parachute opens, breaking his fall. He sways from side to side, working the shroud lines of his chute to aim towards the woods. He can see smoke rising from where his plane must have crashed, the plane he named after his sweetheart back home. Goodbye, glamorous Glennis. He grabs onto the top of a 20-foot pine tree to break his fall, then bends the sapling with his weight to lower himself slowly to the ground. For a second, it's almost fun. Riding trees like this is something he did as a boy in the woods of West Virginia, a memory from home in the hell of war. Safely on the ground, he gathers up his parachute. As he does, he notices that there's blood on his pants leg, on his torn up leather gloves, smeared across his boots. He limps off deeper into the woods, dragging the chute out of sight, then peels off his flight suit. Damn, his calf has a hole in it. He must have taken a bullet or a piece of shrapnel in the hail of gunfire that brought down his plane. He was too wired on adrenaline to even notice. Now that he knows it's there, it hurts. <sighs> He takes some antiseptic sulfa powder from his emergency kit and sprinkles it on the wound, then bandages it up. Then he tears out the silk map of Europe sewn into his flight suit. All right, let's see, where the hell am I? On his way down, he saw mountains to his south, the Pyrenees. If he can cross them, he can get to Spain, which is allied territory. It's March. The mountains are still covered in snow. If he's lucky, he'll meet someone from the French resistance who can help him along the way. But right now, the Germans are still looking for him. So he climbs under a thick bush and eats a stale chocolate bar from his survival kit. Then, clutching the chocolate in one hand and his 45 caliber pistol in the other, he sets off. Jaeger not only manages to get out from behind enemy lines, he petitions the top military brass to send him back. He goes on to become a double ace pilot with 11 kills. His specialty is dogfighting, air-to-air combat. For him, it's a clean contest of skill, stamina, and courage, and an adrenaline rush. 
In February 1945, Jaeger finally comes home from the war. The first thing he does is marry his sweetheart, Glenis, the woman he names all his planes after. He takes her back home to West Virginia to meet his parents. A few months after his return, his hometown of Hamlin throws him a parade and gives him a hero's welcome. The newspaper runs stories about his many exploits. Glenis reads them with her mouth open. You escaped from a Spanish prison? You petitioned General Eisenhower? Is this stuff true? I don't, I don't know about all that. Oh my gosh, it is true, isn't it? You're so modest. Were you ever going to tell me any of these stories? You know I'm not the type to brag. Hey, what are you doing? I'm starting a scrapbook. I bet our kid will want to know about all this stuff. Our kid? Are you trying to tell me something? She is. Glennis is pregnant. When the war ends in September 1945, Jaeger decides to stick with the only thing he knows, flying for the military in the Army Air Corps. Because he'd been an evader, someone who'd escaped from behind enemy lines, he gets to choose his assignment and base. Since Glennis is pregnant and Jaeger is going to be working long hours, they want to be near family. So Jaeger gets out a map and a string and measures which base is closest to his parents' house in West Virginia. It happens to be the historic Wright Field in Ohio. It's a lucky choice. Jaeger has stumbled into the most exciting place on Earth to be a fighter pilot. Aviation is shifting from the propeller-driven planes Jaeger flew during the war to jet and rocket-powered aircraft. And as an assistant maintenance officer in the flight test division, Jaeger gets to fly all of them. Jaeger's in heaven. He climbs out of one cockpit and into another, taking new jet after new jet out for a spin. The planes are so fast that he can swoop over his parents' house in West Virginia, where Glennis is staying, 200 miles from the base. And every time he repairs a plane, he has to take it up in the air afterwards to check his work. So he's doing more flying than the actual test pilots. The test pilots are all college grads with no combat experience. And Jaeger is a decorated veteran with only a high school education. They do not get along. Jaeger doesn't understand their engineering terminology, and they smirk at his West Virginia hillbilly accent. So Jaeger can't resist getting a rise out of them, the only way he knows how. It's a hot day in July 1945. In a clear blue sky, Jaeger circles his plane over right field, watching as one of the test pilots takes off. As soon as the test pilot reaches altitude, Jaeger dives straight at him. <laughs> Let's see if your college degree helps you now. The test pilot panics and turns tail back to the airfield. Jaeger follows, landing right behind him. Furious, the test pilot climbs out of his plane and charges towards Jaeger's. What is wrong with you? Are you crazy? Jaeger climbs down from the cockpit, laughing. How are you going to truly test a plane if you don't fly it all the way? You gotta make the machine talk to you, push it to its limits. The test pilot is still shaking. Whether from rage or terror, Jaeger can't tell. We're precision flyers, Jaeger. Our job is to follow the test protocol and monitor the gauges, not do acrobatics. But you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? You don't know how to follow directions. It's true. Jaeger doesn't like being told what to do. He bends rules like pretzels when he can. And that even more than his West Virginia accent, makes him an outsider at right, despite all his years of combat experience. The pilot jabs a shaky finger into Jaeger's chest. Why don't you stick to servicing planes and I'll worry about flying them? As the pilot storms off, Jaeger turns and heads back to the cockpit of his plane. He can't wait to get back in the air and look for the next test pilot to start a dogfight with. In the wake of World War II, Air shows are all the rage. Tens of thousands of people go to their local airports to watch military planes swoop over them, doing aerial tricks. The test pilots at Wright Airfield have no interest in participating. Air shows are beneath them, but not Jaeger. He always volunteers. He loves swooping down, doing rolls, flying low over the grandstands. As long as he gets himself and the plane back in one piece, nobody seems to mind him showing off for the crowds. In November 1945, Jaeger flies a new kind of jet called a shooting star for an open house event at Wright Field. The assistant maintenance officer 
is the star attraction. A few days later, he's called into an office on the second floor of the headquarters building. Uh, I'm here to see Colonel Boyd. Have a seat. A pilot slinks out of Boyd's office, looking like a kid who's just been chewed out by the principal. Colonel Albert Boyd has a reputation for being very strict, with a mean bark and a mean bite. Jaeger, you wanted to see me, sir. Boyd is tall and bald, with thick, dark eyebrows and a strong jaw. He's top military aviation brass, in charge of the test flights at Wright Field. He does not sit down, so neither does Jaeger, who tries to hide his nervousness. So you want to be a test pilot? A test pilot? Well, sure, sir, but but what? Well, I'm not very well educated, sir. I, I only finished high school. Boyd waves this away. I saw you fly the shooting star. We need someone with your skills. I want you to enroll in our test pilot school ASAP. If you need tutoring on the engineering, our other test pilots can help you. I don't know, sir. I'm sure they'd get a kick out of watching me fail. Then don't give them the satisfaction. And try to keep yourself in one piece. Go easy on the stunt flying. I have you in mind for something. Yes, sir. Colonel Boyd sits, so Jaeger does too. This moment of peace we're in, Jaeger. And how long do you think it will last? The Soviets are gaining ground. There will be a time when we'll need to defend ourselves and we won't be able to do it with the planes we have now. We need faster planes. And some of the prototypes we're getting, well, frankly, the guys I have now aren't up to the task of flying them. Jaeger may not be well-read, but he knows what Colonel Boyd is talking about. Communist Russia, an ally in World War II, is now a geopolitical rival. And there's a new kind of conflict brewing between them. Not a fight on the battlefield, but a fight over the latest technology. Rockets, missiles, the atomic bomb, and jet fighters. Colonel Boyd leans across his desk, dark eyebrows furrowed. So what do you say, Jaeger? Are you up for it? Jaeger smiles at the colonel. Yes, sir. I believe I am. If you're a business owner, you don't need me to tell you that running a business is tough but you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. It's time to upgrade to NetSuite. Seriously, you've got to stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. Ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software you've outgrown, because now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. Why? Well, because NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need, all in one place, instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, you're going to save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash AI. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash AI. It's spring of 1947, and Colonel Albert Boyd is on his way to meet with one of his test pilots, and he's not in a good mood. He stops a mechanic in the hallway. Where's Goodland? Uh, In the simulator, sir. Boyd has been put in charge of testing the X-1 a brand new plane designed to go faster than the speed of sound. It was developed by the company Bell Aircraft, under contract with the military. They assigned their own test pilot to the plane, a dapper, arrogant character named Chalmers Slick Goodlin. He's not military, and Boyd hated him on sight. Then Slick demanded a bonus of $150,000, the equivalent of $1.7 million in today's money before he'd agree to take the X-1 up to the speed of sound. For Boyd, that was the last straw. Is he in there? Yes, Colonel. Should be done with this test any minute. Slick is inside a vibrating wooden mock-up of the X-1. It simulates the buffeting a plane experiences as it approaches the speed of sound. Boyd yells to the engineer, Shut it down! Before the machine has even stopped shaking, Boyd strides up and delivers the news. You're fired! Boyd is sick of relying on civilians for research and development. 
The conventional wisdom has always been that while combat veterans have more flight experience, they lack the patience and objectivity necessary to test the new high-tech planes. But Boyd sees things differently. He's a former military test pilot himself, and even set some speed records. He knows having instincts is just as important as having brains. He just needs to pick the right guy. Boyd puts together a short list of contenders to send to the Bell Aircraft Corporation plant in Buffalo, New York. Among them is Chuck Yeager, who's just completed test pilot school at Boyd's behest. At the Bell plant, Yeager and his brainy, chain-smoking pal from flight school, Jack Ridley, walk through a hangar-sized lab filled with stainless steel tanks and strange-looking equipment. The two pilots make an odd couple. Jaeger is tall and broad-shouldered, and Ridley is short with elfin ears that stick straight out. Jaeger elbows his friend as they gaze around. It's like Frankenstein's lab in here. What do you reckon's in all these vats? I think they're about to tell us. The engineer giving them a tour stops in front of a big vat smoking with mist. Jaeger and Ridley shiver. Just being near it is like standing in a freezer. The X-1 has a rocket engine that's fueled by ethyl alcohol and liquid oxygen, not gasoline. When combined, they create an explosive chemical reaction. This is the oxygen. To keep it in a liquid state, it has to be kept extremely cold. Here, I'll, I'll show you. Like a mad scientist, the engineer takes a live frog out of his lab coat pocket. Using tongs, he dips the poor frog into the liquid oxygen. When he pulls it out, just seconds later, it's frozen solid. Then the engineer drops the frog on the floor where it shatters into tiny pieces. Jaeger jumps back, startled. What'd you do that for? (laughs) Now you'll remember never to stick your hand in that stuff. He walks them further into the cavernous lab towards a four chamber rocket engine held in place with chains. Well, how about it? You wanna fire her up? Jaeger beams. He gets to do the honors. He flips a switch and fires off the first rocket chamber. A sheet of flame shoots 20 feet out the back door of the hangar. Everyone covers their ears. Then Jaeger flips the second switch. It's so loud, the ceiling starts to rattle and plaster dust rains down on everyone. Jaeger flicks off the two switches. I'll hold off on the other two chambers. Yeah, you get the idea. Ready to see the X-1? Their ears still ringing from the rocket engine, Jaeger and Ridley follow the engineer into the next hangar to finally see the main attraction. Oh, whoa. It's the most impressive plane he's ever seen. The X-1, the bright orange beast. Built to withstand 18 Gs, 18 times the force of gravity, and to travel over 760 miles per hour, past the speed of sound. The plane's body is shaped like a bullet. Its nose is a needle. Its tail is thin and high, and the wings are thinner than any Jaeger has ever seen. He runs his thumb along the edge of one wing, and it's sharp as a knife. They're built that way to dissipate shock waves and reduce drag. But from a pilot's point of view, they look deadly. Jaeger turns to Ridley. How would you bail out of a plane with wings like that? You wouldn't. You'd be cut in half. As Jaeger studies the plane more closely, it occurs to him Bell and the military don't want test pilots bailing out of their top-secret aircraft. If this plane goes down, you go down with it. Jaeger takes in the shiny length of the aircraft. His heart pounds. He looks at Ridley and grins. Ain't she something? Most test pilots take one look at the X-1 and run the other way. But not Jaeger. He practically begs Colonel Boyd for the assignment. Boyd is reluctant at first. Usually, the most dangerous assignments in the test pilot program are reserved for bachelors with no next of kin. But in the end, he relents. Jaeger is his best pilot, and the X-1 is the Air Corps' best shot at finally breaking the sound barrier. Still, Jaeger is a controversial choice. His lack of a college education looks bad on paper, but Boyd has to go with his gut. Jaeger is good under pressure, and when he flies, it's like he becomes one with the plane. It's a skill you can't teach, a skill that might just keep Jaeger alive as he attempts to break Mach 1. It's July 1947, 
at Muroc Airfield in California's Mojave Desert, the middle of nowhere. As Jaeger drives up to the base, he watches the barracks and plane hangars ripple in the summer heat, like a flickering mirage. It's the perfect location for testing a top-secret airplane, because it's remote, but also because a nearby dry lake bed provides a natural landing strip. Now, Glennis Jaeger and her husband step out of the car and into the heat. She holds their toddler son in her arms, taking it all in. The dust, the lake bed, the scraggly Joshua trees. Nothing for miles in every direction. Glennis isn't one to complain, but Jaeger can read it all over her face. Well, hon, you knew what you were getting into when you married me. She puts on a determined look. It'll be an adventure. A few weeks later, Jaeger is in a big open lab at the base, training with the research engineers. Today, he's testing a pressure suit in a vacuum chamber. The military wants Jaeger to test the X-1 at high altitude, where the atmosphere is thinner and generates less resistance. The problem is, once you get above 46,000 feet, you need a pressure suit to keep you alive. The thinner atmosphere also means the lungs can't function without outside help. But in 1947, that outside help is bulky, to say the least. Awkwardly, Jaeger buckles the last straps on his suit. I look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. The researcher grins as he adjusts the wiring on the suit. Next time, we'll try to find something more flattering to your figure. Don't forget to hook up the oxygen this time. During the previous test, a researcher had forgotten to do this for Jaeger's backup pilot. The poor guy turned purple before they realized their mistake. With his pressure suit secured, Jaeger climbs into a small metal chamber. It feels like being inside a submarine. The researcher locks the door in place and switches on a vent. A few stray papers fly up into the air. Jaeger waves at the researcher through the round window as it fogs up almost immediately. In less than a second, they pump most of the air out of the chamber, and Jaeger gets a sense of what it's like at 100,000 feet. After the test, the engineer helps Jaeger crawl out of the chamber and pulls off his helmet. Jaeger shuts his eyes tight for a moment, letting a wave of nausea and throbbing pain pass over him. Ready for the centrifuge? I'll tell you, these tests are more traumatic than actually flying. Well, this way you'll know you're ready. Aside from the physical preparation, Jaeger also has to attend the pre-flight planning sessions held by NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Later renamed NASA, it's the agency in charge of all the monitoring instruments aboard the X-1. The sessions are highly technical, and Jaeger struggles through them. Jack Ridley, his flight engineer, helps by translating the jargon into layman's terms. After one particularly bewildering session with the NACA engineers, Jaeger and Ridley stay behind in the empty conference room. Jaeger stares blankly at the formulas and charts that cover the chalkboard. He's overwhelmed and frustrated. I mean, why can't these desk jockeys speak English? Inertial coupling, longitudinal stability. I'll, I'll never learn all this stuff. You'll get it, Chuck. Just remember, the main thing is your first flights will all be drop launches. So the B-29 will carry the X-1 like a bomb and then drop it at 25,000 feet. That high up, if anything goes wrong, you'll have time to dump your fuel and land on the lake bed. You can't land with any fuel still in the plane, or you might explode. Jaeger watches his friend light one cigarette with the end of another. Tell me the truth, Ridley. Can I do this? What about that British guy whose plane blew up in the sky last year? The sound barrier isn't real. The only barrier is bad aerodynamics and bad planning. Bell has designed the perfect airplane for this program, and we're not going to make any mistakes getting there. If you say so, Jack. But I gotta admit, I'm a little intimidated by that orange beast. Ah, don't worry, Chuck. You make quick friends with every bird you fly. That X-1 won't bite you without warning. As with every plane Jaeger flies, he paints the name Glamorous Glennis on the plane's nose. His wife's name is his good luck charm. It's August 6th, 1947, the day of Jaeger's first trip on the X-1. He's sitting behind Ridley in the cockpit of a B-29 Superfortress, a huge bomber designed to fly at very high altitudes. There's no extra seats in the crowded cockpit, so Jaeger squats on an overturned apple crate. 
Below them, strapped into the B-29's massive bomb bay, is the X-1. Its powerful engine has not yet been installed. This will be an engineless glide flight, a chance for Jaeger to get a feel for how the plane's strange, bullet-shaped design handles. When they reach 12,000 feet, Ridley turns to Jaeger and yells over the roar of the B-29's engines. Showtime! You ready? Jaeger nods and crawls through a hatch into the bomb bay, with Ridley following him to assist. He climbs down a ladder to the X-1's cockpit. The bomb bay doors are open, and at this altitude, it's freezing. The wind is howling, too loud for him and Ridley to speak. Jaeger's in a flight suit and a leather jacket, but he isn't wearing his gloves, so he can get a better grip on the rungs of the ladder. If he slips, that last step is 12,000 feet down. He slides into the cockpit of the X-1 feet first. Ridley lowers the cockpit door, and Jaeger locks it from the inside. In the cramped cockpit, Jaeger puts on his homemade helmet and his oxygen mask. He hooks into the communication system. Then he sits in the dark of the bomber, waiting. His heart beating fast in his chest. He hears Ridley's voice over the radio. All set, Jaeger? You bet. Let's go to work. The B-29 pilot counts him off. Three, two, one. Something snaps, and the X-1 jolts, then begins a free fall. The bright sun blinds him. For a moment, even Jaeger is terrified. Then, instinct and adrenaline take over. He's making the machine talk to him. It's August 6, 1947, and Chuck Yeager has just completed his first test flight of the X-1. He climbs out of the cockpit and steps down onto the dry lake bed next to Muroc Airfield. He has a grin so wide, his face feels like it's about to crack in half. Best damn airplane I ever flew. Even without an engine, the X-1 is a thrill to pilot. He can't wait to fly this beautiful plane when there's some power behind it. Before their first powered flight, Colonel Boyd comes out to Muroc. He, Jaeger, and Jack Ridley meet in one of the ramshackle offices in the barracks. The dust blows in through the open windows. Without air conditioning, it's too hot to close them. <coughs> the men cover their eyes and noses. Boyd wipes his face with a handkerchief and goes back to his notes. Start out easy. Don't stretch the program by getting too eager. Read your instruments and report what you see. Jaeger nods. Ridley and I figured that since Slick Goodland got it to 0.8 Mach, we can start at 0.82 Mach. Boyd considers this. Okay, you can go up in increments of two hundredths of a Mach on each flight, but no more than that. It's settled. Boyd gets up to leave, ready to escape this desert heat. Oh, and one more thing. Did I hear that you did something to the paint job? I named the plane, sir. Any plane I name after my wife, Glennis, always brings me home. For a moment, Boyd bristles, but then he seems to reconsider. This is a top secret plane, Captain, not a bathroom wall. But I'm not one to mess with pilots' good luck charms. Thank you, sir. It's August 29th, 1947. The engine has been installed on the X-1, and today is the day for Jaeger's first powered flight. Jaeger stands in a vaporous cloud as he watches the technicians fuel his plane with liquid oxygen and ethyl alcohol. The fuel is so cold that even though it's summer in the Mojave, frost forms under the belly of the orange plane. With Ridley's help, Jaeger goes through all the pre-flight procedures. He checks all his fuel pressure gauges, his cockpit instrumentation, his landing gear. He's ready. Once again, at 12,000 feet, Jaeger climbs into the bomber bay of the B-29 Superfortress, then into the cramped cockpit of the X-1. This time, it feels different. During his previous glide test flights, there was no engine or fuel in the plane. Now the X-1 is 3,000 pounds heavier. The fuel is stored at minus 296 degrees, so the cockpit is freezing. Jaeger's teeth chatter as he waits for the pilot of the B-29 to do a count off. He rubs his hands together for warmth. Three. There's enough fuel on this plane that if it accidentally ignited, the explosion would scatter Jaeger's body over several counties. Two. Jaeger is afraid, but it doesn't feel like fear or even giddiness. 
He's in the zone, alert, focused, ready for any unexpected thing that comes his way. One. The bomb shackle releases the X-1, but something is wrong. He's tilted up towards the sky instead of being dropped level the way he's supposed to be. Jaeger blinks away the blinding light of the sun. Damn. He spins the control wheel, turning it as fast as he can, trying to reorient the plane. Finally, he's level, a thousand feet below the B-29. Moment of truth. Jaeger lights the first chamber of the rocket. The force of the engine slams Jaeger back into his seat. And then it goes quiet. Jaeger can hear his own breath in the oxygen mask. He can hear the air against the plane's windshield. The noise of the plane itself grows fainter. He's going so fast, he's outrunning the sound of his own engine. He angles the plane up and climbs. He shuts off the first rocket chamber and lights the next one. The force pushes him back again, and he climbs higher. Whew, this ride! At 45,000 feet, the sky begins to look different. The light is dimmer so high up. It's a clear day, and he can see the desert below him, the flat expanse stretching towards mountains. According to his flight plan, this is when Jaeger is supposed to dump his remaining fuel and glide on down to the lake bed. But he's not ready to go home yet. He's up at the edge of the world, in the most amazing plane in history, and he wants to have some fun. He still has half his fuel left and decides it's time to see what else this big orange beast can do. Roll time. Jaeger lowers his wing and rolls the plane. He's upside down, a trick from his stunt flying days. Woohoo! Which the X-1 wasn't designed to do. The engine stalls. Oops. He shouldn't have done that. That was dumb, risky. He shuts off the engine and rights the plane. He's lucky, no harm done. Now, he should probably dump the fuel like he's supposed to and land the thing, but he doesn't. It's barely even a conscious choice. He's in the zone, running on pure adrenaline. He dives for the airfield. The plane, still heavy with fuel, is dropping like a rock. He checks his gauges, 0.8 Mach. Ha, let's show those bastards the real X-1. He dives past 10,000 feet, the last opportunity to safely dump his fuel. Then past 5,000. This is like his air show days. People below better be holding onto their hats. Now he's just 300 feet over the main runway when he pulls out of his dive and fires off all the remaining rocket chambers. So far, he has only fired one rocket chamber at a time, as per NACA instructions. They want him to be able to closely monitor chamber pressures, and doing two at once could cause abrupt changes. But in the moment, Eger isn't thinking about that. He is flying straight up, nose pointed at the sky, like he's in a rocket. Like you could leave Earth's gravity entirely and fly off into space. Straight up at 0.75 Mach. Come on, you beautiful orange bird. Let's see what you can do. At 35,000 feet, he maxes out at 0.85 Mach. His fuel is all gone, used up in a minute. He points the X-1's needle nose back towards Earth and begins the long glide home. Wow, what a ride. When he lands the plane and climbs down from the cockpit, Jaeger is still smiling, but nobody else is. Not the NACA engineers, not the other pilots. Even Ridley's face is grave. Jesus, Chuck, what the hell are we gonna tell Boyd? The consequences of what he's done begin to sink in. Jaeger's smile fades as he imagines facing Boyd's fury. Maybe you can help me write him a letter, explaining it? But Ridley backs away, shaking his head. I won't be your go-between, not on this. You broke with the flight plan and went rogue. You did it. You get yourself out of it. That night, Jaeger sends Boyd a telegram. The violation of your direct orders was due to the excited state of the undersigned and will not be repeated. Then he waits. No response. Jaeger has no idea what to think. Boyd is usually so decisive. Why is the colonel letting him twist in the wind like this? Finally, a few days later, the phone rings. Jaeger has been waiting on pins and needles for the call. This is Jaeger. Damn it, I expect you to stick to the program and do what you were supposed to. Don't get over-eager and don't get cocky. 
Do you want to jeopardize the whole project? No, sir. Well, then obey the goddamn rules. I guess I just got excited, sir. It, it won't happen again. Breaking the sound barrier won't be a one-man, devil-may-care sideshow. There's a step-by-step -step program. Can you get with that program, Captain? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And without another word, Boyd hangs up. Jaeger holds the phone in his hand, in shock. If he understood his boss correctly, he hasn't been taken off the project. He's going to have another chance to fly the X-1. But if he messes up again, it would put the whole military flight test program at risk. And if they don't break the sound barrier soon, someone else might beat them to it. The Soviets, for example. Jaeger knows how much is riding on this. And he knows he's being given one last shot. No more going off script. Unless, of course, he doesn't have a choice. On our next episode, an accident on solid ground jeopardizes Jaeger's best chance to finally take the X-1 past the speed of sound. From Wondery, this is episode one of Breaking the Sound Barrier on American Innovations. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now or wherever you're listening right now. And to listen to these episodes one week early, join Wondery Plus. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey. Tell us which innovation stories you'd like to hear. And a quick note about the recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, those scenes or dramatizations but they're based on historical research. American Innovations is hosted by me, Stephen Johnson. For more information on my books and television shows about science and innovation, including my upcoming one, Extra Life, The Short History of Living Longer, you can visit my website, stephenberlinjohnson.com, or follow me on Twitter, at Stephen B. Johnson. Sound design on this episode is by Jason Freeman. This episode was written by Katya Apikina, with editing by Liza Veal. Produced by Andy Herman and Natalie Shisha. Executive produced by Jenny Lauer Beckman, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. <laughs>